Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham, Massachusetts, United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, November 15th, 2020 is entitled, Manna, I Did Not Order This. It's a reflection on a reading from Exodus, chapter 16, Selected Verses. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministries at the Congregational Church of Needham, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. Our reading today is from Exodus, chapter 16, Selected Verses, from the Contemporary English Version of the Bible. On the fifteenth day of the second month after the Israelites had escaped from Egypt, they set out through the western edge of the Sinai Desert in the direction of Mount Sinai. There in the wilderness, they started complaining to Moses and Aaron, We wish the Lord had killed us in Egypt. When we lived there, we could at least sit down and eat all the bread and meat we wanted. But you have brought us out here into this desert where we are going to starve. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard my people complain. Now tell them that each evening they will have meat, and each morning they will have more than enough bread. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. Each day the people can go out and gather only enough for that day. But on the sixth day of each week, they may gather and cook twice as much in preparation for the Sabbath. And I will see if they trust me. Moses and Aaron told the people, This very evening you will know that the Lord was the one who rescued you from Egypt. And in the morning you will see God's glorious power, because God has heard your complaints. That very evening, flocks of quail came and landed everywhere in the camp. And the next morning, dew covered the ground. And after the dew had gone, the desert was covered with thin flakes that looked like frost. The people had never seen anything like this, and they started asking each other, What is it? Moses answered, This is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat, and God instructs you to gather only enough for a day for each person. And they did so. Some gathered more and some gathered less, according to their needs, and none was left over. Moses told them not to keep any overnight, but some of them disobeyed, and the next morning the excess was stinking and full of worms. Each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed, and in the heat of the day the rest melted like wax. However, on the sixth day of the week, everyone gathered enough for two days, and the next morning the food smelled fine and had no worms. You may eat the food, Moses said, for today is the Sabbath, a day of rest in honor of the Lord and there won't be any food on the ground today. The Israelites called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and delicious as wafers made with honey. Moses told the people that the Lord had said, Store up some of this manna, because I want future generations to see the food I gave you during the time you were in the desert after I rescued you from Egypt. Aaron followed the Lord's instructions and put the manna in front of the sacred chest for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years before they came to the border of Canaan that was a settled land. Friends, God is still speaking to the world and to us. May our hearts be open to listen and to respond. Amen. One of the biggest challenges to our reading the Bible well, if indeed we read it at all, is that it's just so easy. It is so easy to read Bible stories as, well, Bible stories and not true stories. That is, true-to-life stories, not necessarily historically factually true stories. It's so easy to read Bible people as, well, Bible people and not real people, people more like us than we might care to admit. 
with all the same kinds of hopes and dreams, fears and anxieties, faults and frailties and possibilities. And it's so, so easy to read ourselves onto God's side in these stories instead of recognizing we are not always the heroes or even all that often. Take our reading today from the book of Exodus. It's just so easy for us to side with God and Moses and Aaron here against the grumblings of the Israelites. Here they are, freshly freed from bondage in Egypt by the liberating power of God, acting on their behalf with signs and wonders, plagues, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The Red Sea split in two, all in support of God's promise to bring them into a new home of their own. And already the people are whining. Oh my God, we're so hungry. Wish God had just killed us in Egypt. Sure, they treated us like cattle, but at least cattle get fed regularly. But out here in the wilderness, what are we supposed to do? Starve? It's so easy to think to ourselves, silly Israelites, suck it up and show some gratitude, huh? Jeez. As if we can't imagine how they might feel or why they might feel that way after generations of suffering, systemic and specific suffering, as if we can't imagine how trust might be as thin on the ground among them in that moment as, say, food in the Sinai Desert, even as their fears run wild. Egypt was terrible, it's true, but at least it was predictable and never, ever underestimate our all-too-human predilection for predictability. We will take the known terrible over almost any kind of unknown 9.99 times out of 10. It's just how we're wired, evolutionarily speaking. Even from my own relatively extremely comfortable experience of life, I get where the Israelites are coming from. Which really makes our usual Sunday school reading of what happens next in the story even more bizarre. You see, in answer to their needs and to their cries, God provides the people with manna, with quail every evening and with manna every morning, basketfuls of manna, a white flaky, seed-like substance that just appears on the ground like frost, that melts away easily in the heat of the day like wax, that tastes like wafers made with honey, but if you keep it just a little too long, turns wormy and foul, that modern scholars imagine may have been a sort of gummy tree resin, or perhaps, perhaps a sort of lichen or moss or mold that the Israelites are going to be eating every meal every single day for the next 40 years. So thank you, God. I mean, yay, manna. But what is it really? Which is what manna means, really from the Aramaic for, what the heck is it? Which also sounds like a much more understandable human response than the simple, unadulterated gratitude we're encouraged to imagine the Israelites had for this gift. I mean, they may have gotten to gratitude eventually, but I doubt it was their first response, or their second, or their third. That wafers and honey bit smacks of long after the fact nostalgia to me or marketing. What would feel more realistic to me would be something more like, 
manna? Excuse me, but I did not order this. I did not order this manna, whatever it is exactly, or the constant hunger and thirst and cold and heat, or the wandering in the wilderness, or the worrying and the confusion and the outright abject fear, or the generations of oppression that preceded it while we're at it. Thanks for the liberation and all, but manna, really? Because gratitude, as we generally think about it, a hallmark card kind of gratitude is easy in good times when we feel like we have a comfortable laundry list of blessings to run down. But what about the dirty laundry? What about the stuff that's hard or awkward or painful? What about the gifts ostensibly from God, that we did not ask for and do not want. How are we to be grateful for them? How are we to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, as First Thessalonians instructs us? Or to count it all joy, when we meet trials of various kinds, as the epistle of James encourages us? How are we to be thankful when our cup isn't running over or is in fact half empty or less? How are we to be grateful in the midst of a pandemic? I'm gonna be very honest and say, I'm not really sure, but I'm working on it. What I am sure about is that this kind of expanded sense of gratitude involves setting aside our lists of blessings and our lists of curses. It doesn't involve lists at all because it's not about things. It's not about having them or not having them. It sure isn't about ignoring our all too human feelings and choosing instead to smile Pollyannishly through it all. The God who gives us life gives us these feelings, too. And the God who comes to us in Jesus to share our life, right down to the dregs, right down to the cross and the tomb, is big enough to take all our feelings, even the unpleasant ones. Which, again, is sort of the point Real gratitude, deeper gratitude has got to move beyond merely saying thank you for the gifts we actually acknowledge and enjoy. Though that's a good place to start, it is a pretty low bar and definitely a temporary one as the wheel of life grinds on. At least I have my job for now. At least I have my house for now. At least I have my health for now. You see where this is going and how far it really gets you. In the same passage of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, where he talks about a peace from God which surpasses all understanding, he also talks about learning to be content, that is, to be grateful for whatever he has or doesn't, because he knows what it is to have little and to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, he says, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things. I can endure all things. I can even give thanks for all things, not for the sake of the things themselves, good or bad, but through Christ who strengthens me, through the love of Christ for me, for Christ's presence with me, even in times of trouble, especially in times of trouble, in the presence of my holy friends who represent God to me in trials and in rejoicing. In other words, I can give thanks at all times 
not just for the gifts or in spite of the challenges, not because of the trials for sure, or even because of the rejoicing, but simply because I am. I am here. I am alive, and I am not alone. Not ever. No one is ever alone. You are not alone. The absolute rock-solid core of our incarnational, fleshy faith is this, that no matter what, God is with us. Not just on our side, but at our side. Even when the glories of the morning fade into the shadows of the evening, even in the wild places of hunger and thirst, far out beyond our likes and dislikes, our wants and desires, in the dry land of deep human need. God is there. Not to dispense prizes to some and punishments to others, but to be with us, to live with us in love, even to suffer with us for love. God is with us here and now in the midst of this pandemic, in this wilderness of confusion, dissension, and strife, systemic and specific. God is with us in the stresses of our family life, amplified by being too close to some too for too long and too far from others. God is with us in the stresses of our human family life as well, where some have been too privileged and others too deprived for far, far too long. God is with us in the stresses of our planet as well. Once again, Mr. Rogers, that is Presbyterian pastor, the Reverend Fred Rogers, said it so well and so simply in a quote that is more often shared than it is understood. After the terrible events of 9-11, in the shadow of the attacks that brought down the planes and the towers and our national peace of mind, Mr. Rogers spoke to the children and to the child in each of us, saying, when I was a boy and I would see scary things, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. Look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. In other words, God isn't the bomb blast or the lost job or the virus. God isn't using these things to teach us anything, as though suffering were God's preferred pedagogical tool. But rather, God is there in the midst of it all in our response to those challenges, in our best and despite our worst, Christ is with and in the helpers and the helped and even the helpless. Christ's presence is with us in the hoping and the hopeless, in the sheer human living of it all. Christ is there when we manage simply to put one foot in front of the other. And when we don't, when we can't even bring ourselves to get out of bed, when we are stone cold buried in the tomb, Christ is still there. And it's for this presence. And if we can manage it for God's persistent, pressing purposes of justice, peace, and compassion, despite all evidence to the contrary, we give thanks. Not just for any particular goodies we might have gotten along the way. That is the strange and marvelous manna that God provides for us this morning and every morning. It may not be what we'd ordered. In fact, I can't imagine that it is. And it's sure less than we'd like in those crisis moments, in these crisis moments. But let's be honest. It may not be what we want, but it is what we need. It will sustain life even in the face of death and even beyond it. 
And for this gift, unwarranted and unwanted, but needed so deeply in this season of gratitude, we try, we try to give a very complicated thanks. And so beloved, I am grateful for your presence with me and I am grateful for the gift of being able to be present with you even in this unwarranted and unimagined way. I'm grateful that we are together and together we are the presence of God for each other and for the world. This is our witness of gratitude, even in this pandemic moment. And so if you've heard the word of God preached here today, remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen.